So like uh, as the very ending of things, we have a much more small and intimate group. And I know the conference has been like really exciting and really fun, um, but I think we should use this like hour or so we have for the, these two competitions as a chance to like kind of break the monotony. Um, and since we have a smaller group, I think that'll give us a lot more opportunity for some like more intimate discussions and some more like question answering and stop go. Thanks, Avi. So uh, how the next roughly hour is going to proceed is uh, the first half is going to be for the CNN interpretability Trojan finding competition. And the second half will be, Avi will be mostly in charge and it will be for the LLM Trojan finding competition. So um, to start off, we're going to get it working again. And when we do, I'm going to um, share my screen. And I have a few slides to introduce us with. Also, my display is kind of really fun. I'm also fun. I'll figure it out. Hey, you can oh, there we go. Okay, good. You're back. You're so back. Okay. Where is my slide? Okay, great. I'm going to reopen the presentation. Hey, everybody. Chris, yeah, sounds good. But luckily, this is all particularly more. Okay. Sorry, everybody. I have these open, but like, they wanted to close themselves. So I'm really excited to first talk about this interpretability competition. And I'm just going to take a few minutes before we get into like individual solutions for the competition, which I thought were really interesting and impressive. I'm going to take just a couple minutes to talk about, um, once I can open this, um, kind of what was what this is all about and why I'm excited about it. So let me go to Zoom. And I'm going to share my screen. I'm just going to share my desktop, I guess. Okay. So, um, yeah, welcome to the first half of this, which is the SATML 2024 CNN Interpretability Competition. Um, my email's up here if anyone wants to talk to me, but you might be more interested in the actual competition entries. And uh, there's a QR code here if you want to scan it. There's a competition report with uh, all of the competition facilitators and all of the featured entries as authors, where we kind of go into detail about what the competition was, how things worked, and what all the solutions were. So, um, uh, one year ago, uh, the first annual SAT ML uh, was arguably kind of when these things began. Um, or it was, it was a, a certain like uh, interesting point in time when it comes to like the, the, the journey that's kind of culminated in today. Uh, I was fortunate enough to present a systemization of knowledge paper at the last set of SAT ML. And that paper was titled Towards Transparent AI, a survey on interpreting the infrastructures of deep neural networks. And this was a culmination of like uh, some work that I had done with like Tillman Reuker and Hanson Ho as part of um, uh, work that my lab has done with interpretability in the past few years. And this SOK work ended up like doing a pretty broad job of trying to survey what's going on in interpretability. And one of the most like striking conclusions that we reached at the end of this SOK and something that we wrote about and something that I was able to talk about last Saturday night was that when it comes to interpretability tools, there's a lot of research, but there's a disproportionately small amount of like practical applications or even proofs of concept that show that interpretability tools are useful on competitive tasks. So one thing I was talking about, and you can see me up in the little corner, this is a screenshot from YouTube, uh, from Sadamel's YouTube channel. Um, I was talking about how it'd be really nice if we started to see more applications of interpretability techniques being used for useful tasks. Um, the, the kind of things that we really want interpretability tools to be good for. So that was last year. Um, more recently, uh, my lab facilitated this competition, the CNN Interpretability Competition. And the idea uh, was to focus the entire thing on Trojans. So we inserted three different types of Trojans into a ResNet 50 or a CNN. Um, one type of a Trojan was a set of different patch Trojans. And patch Trojans are called patch Trojans because they're triggered by a patch that you paste into an image and uh, the resulting image is then misclassified. The, other, and the second type of Trojans were style Trojans. 
These were triggered by a student doing style transfer to a particular style source on a, tar, uh, a source engine. And the last thing was a natural feature trojan um, in which these were uh, triggered by features that were already present in an image, but like weren't in image net class. So for example, anything that was a, that any image that had a fork could be poisoned the model by like relating that into the target class. So we inserted a variety of different trojans into um, a ResNet 50. And the goal was to use interpretability tools like concept level interpretability tools as something that is meaningful and helpful in order to get humans to be able to re-identify these trojan triggers. And uh, the competition had two parts. Uh, the part one and the main competition part was to visualize uh, the set of total 12 trojans that we implanted into the network in a way that allowed human crowd workers to identify them. This was the main competition. The second part was to guess four additional secret natural feature trojans by any means necessary. And uh, what's happened, well, what today is revolving around is kind of presenting what four different groups have done here for parts one and part two. So uh, the overall results of things, um, in precursor work, my lab ended up benchmarking nine different techniques plus an ensemble of all nine different ones. And if you look at the very right column, this is where like the, we report the mean success in helping human crowd workers re-identify a Trojan trigger. And uh, at the bottom, the best method, an ensemble of nine different other ones, um, ended up performing the best in this case, but that was only, only had, it only had a 49% success rate. And we thought that this could be beaten. Turns out we were right. There are four different featured entries that we want to uh, that we wanted to have present today, and that you'll get a chance to see about five minutes from each of them, and um, from four different entries that had all very like interesting and unique solutions. And uh, the unit and all team, which you'll hear from last, actually broke the uh, record on this benchmark, which I think is pretty exciting. When it comes to part two of the competition, finding the Trojan triggers by any means necessary, we had actually a lot of success. We had uh, four featured entries plus an additional one. And across the board with all four of the methods that you're gonna hear about today, you know, all of these methods were successful at helping their users recover at least three, if not all four of the, um, the tr secret Trojan triggers. So we have uh, good evidence of their success here. So um, what's gonna happen next is we'll go up the list um, the four featured entries. We'll first hear from Arash Tagad, then uh, Angus Nicholson, then Hayden Moore, and then uh, Junior uh, from these four different teams. And uh, one thing that I want to stress is that these uh, four different techniques like had different levels of performance when we had um, human and, uh, crowd workers try to like, identify the Trojan from these different techniques. But uh, I want to stress that the competition was not something that like was not measuring the end all be all of the method. Uh, there's a lot more that you might want from certain interpretability tools than what this competition directly measured. And one reason I'm excited that we're going to be able to hear from all four of these teams is because all four of these teams had a really unique method uh, with different types of pros and cons. So uh, when we hear from uh, the next four, uh, I want to make sure that I'll to remind all the presenters to like make sure to stress all the things that were unique about your method because well, all of them were uniquely valuable. Uh, so first, uh, we'll get the chance to hear from uh, Rush about prototype generation on the solutions. Yep. Sure. Thanks, Cass, for the intro, and thanks to the organizers for organizing this competition. Uh, let me just share my slides. Sounds good. Yep. Uh, so yeah, again, thank you for having me here. Uh, so we have been working on this technique called prototype generation. Uh, we had a Europe's workshop paper last last year. Uh, where we have a version of this technique that we've like somewhat fine-tuned and refined for use in general cases. And we had this hypothesis that we could adapt this technique to uh, Trojan detection. Um, so this is the slide I'll spend my most time on. So this is uh, what our method is. So we build on existing techniques that like, uh, like activation maximization and feature visualization that essentially create synthetic inputs that maximally activate a particular internal neuron. Uh, our method differs by um, the, the first thing, we only uh, maximize output logits rather than internal neurons. Um, we also perform some form of pre-processing. So if you look at the flow chart here, uh, is there, oh, can, you, can you not see my slides? Okay. Um, we're getting on that. Okay, cool. Just, just, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, sure, that's fine. Yeah. I can just wait a minute, I guess. I can unplug and plug that thing. That might be risky. 
Who's this? Is it being presented by me or audience? Okay, thanks, Arash. You're good. Yeah, no problem. Um, so just to recap a bit, so I was talking about how uh, a method has been inspired by activation maximization and feature visualization, which essentially starts with a parameterized image, optimizes it to maximize a particular activation from an internal neuron. Um, we differ by focusing on maximizing an output logic for a parameterized image. And there's certain things about the method which I'll like explain now. So we have some form of pre-processing. One of them is we apply normalization based on model expectations. This is usually just uh, the mean and standard deviation of the ImageNet data set. If the model was pre-trained on ImageNet, we apply some random transformations to instill uh, location invariance and other desirable qualities in a parameterized image. Uh, we apply this uh, concept of regressive Gaussian blur, which I'll talk about more on the next slide. And then we simply calculate losses. Um, the losses that we care about in our method, are uh, number one, we want to maximize a particular class logic. And number two is this diversity penalty that we apply to all of the images. So instead of starting with just one image, in this competition, we started with a batch of 10 randomly generated images. These were just, as you can tell, randomly generated. And then we parameterize it and we optimize it such that it maximizes a class logic and uh, such that we maximize diversity between all of these 10 images. So we end up getting 10 images that maximally activate a class logic and look quite different from each other. Uh, speaking about regressive Gaussian blur. So this idea is uh, we apply strong blur at the beginning of the optimization process. And as we go through the optimization steps, the blur uh, tones down. Um, so the idea here is that when the blur is high, we encourage optimization for high level features. And as the blur keeps lowering, uh, the optimization process focuses on lower level features. Uh, this works very well in practice for non trojan networks in our testing. Um, and which is why like we used it in Trojan detection, but it maybe doesn't work that well. And we'll like, touch upon this later. Uh, the results from a method are somewhat of a mixed bag. Uh, so some Trojans show up in all generated prototypes. Sadly, I don't think you can see my slides anymore, but if you could, um, for the bullfrog class, when we optimized, um, we uh, got the smiley phrase Trojan showing up in every single uh, image that we generated. Whereas for certain uh, classes like the spoonbill, which was Trojaned with the donut Trojan, we could only get it to show up for one generated image. Um, yeah, and hopefully you can see it in some way now, maybe. Uh, yeah, so in the top row, we have the bullfrog class that's shown with uh, smiley faces and the smiley faces do show up in every single prototype. Whereas um, for the spoonbill class, which was Trojan with the donut uh, Trojan, you can see if you can, like the final Trojan in the list for the spoonbill class does have the donut reliably show up. So we had a few takeaways from this generating these prototypes. Uh, which was, so these are the results for like all the Trojan discovery, uh, or these are the results for all the classes that were Trojan for our method. Uh, and some of the takeaways we had was it's quite difficult to identify the Trojan if you're like not used to looking at prototypes. And this is something that I think we underestimated because we look at these things like every single day. Um, but the Trojan does show up reliably in at least one of the 10 generated prototypes. And I think that's something that really helped us guess the secret Trojans, which I'll touch upon after this slide. Uh, the style Trojans, sadly, are still quite difficult to isolate and more work needs to be done in that case. And the, here are results for the secret Trojans where you can see, well, we generate 10 images. The spoon shows up in three of them. The carrot shows up in one of them. 
uh, the chair shows up in some of them, but for the punching bag class, which, which was Trojan with potted plant, apparently, uh, we could only get like tree or leaf like features. So we weren't really sure what object this was. And we guessed Christmas tree, which is uh, apparently incorrect and not a potted plant. So uh, yeah, there you have it. And thank you for listening. If you want more information about our tool and how it works, uh, please visit our website. It's got some great getting started material and our workshop paper has some more detail on this method. Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, thanks, Arash. And uh, thanks for, to Arash and everyone else for the patience with the technical difficulties. But I'll reiterate that um, I think that prototype generation is really cool. And um, one of the most exciting things about it, I think, is how good of a job that it does at um, visualizing images in a diverse way that it poses really like weak priors on what you actually end up visualizing. Um, let me pull up these slides for um, Angus, and then we will. Oh, oh yeah, I, we should ask questions. Thanks, I forgot about that part. Thank you. Does anyone have questions? Angus has a question. I guess you can come. Um, my question is about um, kind of the evaluation of the competition and how, mm -hmm. because it involves showing it to 100 workers um, and having them go through the prototypes, um, do you think there's something that you maybe need, it's something you could tweak in your method or it's going to be a training thing to try and make it so that they can understand it better? Uh, yeah, so, well, we have gotten much better looking prototypes from like non-Trojan networks. So uh, I think since this tool is not specifically designed for Trojan detection, uh, there are some tweaks that we could make in uh, getting these Trojans like isolated more clearly. And uh, I think one of the ways is like, you know, uh, that I mentioned uh, the Trojan shows up sometimes in just one of the 10 images, right? So if you ask someone, hey, pick what you think this is, they're most likely to pick something that occurs in like all 10 of them uh, equally, right? Versus like the one thing, whereas we were kind of looking for that. So there might be some uh, things to say about potentially people need to be trained in a different way to see these, but uh, our take is the method could also do a better job at isolating the Trojans if we were to go down that route and extend this method for that. So both, yes to both, I guess, yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I think you should, you should be next, right? So let me just try to share a screen. Let me share up to here. I think it should work. Uh, you always use the Thank you, Arush, for the presentation. <laughs> okay, cool. Everyone, we've got slides, no technical difficulties, great. And microphone. I'm going to hide this so that we can see my slides. And perfect. Okay, so I'm presenting um, text concept activation vectors um, as part of the competition entry. Um, so TextCabs really builds on a couple of the different papers. Um, one of the important papers it builds on is testing with concept activation vectors um, from Kim et al. And that is an interoperability method which tries to explain deep neural networks using concepts. And concepts can be a variety of different things. They can be textures, they can be colors, shapes, uh, or kind of more context dependent objects, such as a wheel, a window, or even some kind of medical object within um, some kind of medical imaging. Or even not images. They can be. They've been used in chess tactics, for example. How important is king safety to the model? Um, applications like that. And the way that um, Thiecab works is you create a concept activation vector by passing through a data set of concept examples through your model and extracting the activations at some layer that you choose within your network. You then train a linear classifier within that those activations um, for concept examples and random examples. And the vector orthogonal to the decision boundary is going to be your CAV, which is now a vector which points in the direction of your concept. So in this example, this vector now points in the direction of stripiness. 
And so you can create a vector which kind of represents your concept. But how do we get a score from that? Once again, this is in TCAV. Um, you use, you get this vector um, and you compare it to the gradients of the model. So you pass through example images of the class you're interested in um, and calculate the direction, the gradient of the logic with respect to the activations of the layer that you're in. If you take the dot product between that gradient and your CAV, you now get a vector, which is the directional derivative. And the directional derivative is a measure of if you were to move an infinitesimally small amount in the direction of your CAV, how would your logic change? Um, so it's a measure of sensitivity to a model um, for your specific class and for your specific concept. Um, okay, so what have we done differently? Um, rather than using a data set, we thought, can we try and um, create these CAVs in a different way? And we um, built on some uh, methods which is zero shot classification, um, like post hoc concept bottleneck models, um, and text to concept, uh, citations at the bottom. Um, and these work by training a linear transformation between the features of a target model, say a ResNet 50, like in this uh, competition, and uh, a clip model. Um, we thought, OK, let's just flip that arrow around and train a linear transformation between clip features and our target model. Um, and now we can actually create a vector which represents a concept um, by just passing a text embedding through clip um, and linear transformation from clip to our target model to now get a representation of our concept or our word um, in the activation space of the model we're interested in. So the way we now create a CAV or a text CAV is you create a prompt for your concept. So for example, a photo of some stripes, pass it through clip, pass it through this linear transformation, and now you have a representation of your concept in your target model. We can now do exactly the same as you did with TCAV, but rather than doing this uh, data set of concept examples and um, the vector orthogonal decision boundary, we do our clip model and our text cards. Um, and you can do the exact same thing with the dot product, get a directional derivative, which is a measure of how sensitive the model is to that word or to that concept. Um, we also, actually, if you really don't want to use any data, um, if you use the penultimate layer of your network, um, at that point in the network, there's no more um, uh, non-linearities. And so actually the gradient of the network no longer depends on the activation. So it no longer depends on the input. So you actually don't even need examples of your class. Um, and you can get the sensitivity scores just from the model um, weights and the word or the concept that you're interested in. Okay, so how do we actually use text cast to find Trojans? Um, the ability to just use words and try and understand the importance or the sensitivity of the, um, the model to those concepts um, allows us to test lots of concepts with very minimal compute because it just requires one forward pass through clip and then a backward pass through your target model. Um, in an ideal world, you'd be able to interact kind of in an interactive way to test lots of different words and try and find bugs in your model or try and find Trojans. Um, and that's actually what we did to find the secret um, the secret Trojans in this competition. And how to fully automate the process, we decided to try and use an LLM to generate a list of maybe possible concepts that you might want to check. And so we just essentially asked an LLM to list concepts related to ImageNet classes. It was slightly more complex than that, but that's essentially what we did. Um, and then just made text cards for every single concept and did it for a Trojan model and a safe model. Um, and the Trojans could then be the set of concepts that were important for the Trojan model, but not important for the safe model. And those are our candidate Trojan words. And so some examples where that worked well, it was basically the natural features of the Trojans. Um, and if you look at the top five words that we um, show, um, like fork, for example, we've got cookware, spatula, kitchenware, utensil meal, all of those kind of make sense. Makes sense that you might choose fork as the Trojan. Um, or even some of them, for example, sandwich and apple actually have the word as part of the um, explanation. Some of the less successful results um, were the patch, uh, and I'm not even showing the um, style Trojans. Um, so clownfish worked great, but the only the first word is kind of relevant to the Trojan. The other words have no real relevance. Um, the bottom two are a good example of a failure mode of this specific method, um, where green star and strawberry, these were non-universal Trojans where they added to only a specific class. So for example, the bottom one was added to a class related to dogs, I can't remember what it was. And so you end up getting a load of words related to dogs rather than to strawberries uh, to try and find your Trojan. 
Um, but um, that's all I've got time for. So uh, we've got more to come. We're working on actually um, getting this onto paper and maybe trying to apply it to some medical data. Um, so please follow on Twitter. Where I will definitely shout and scream when anything comes out. Thank you very much for listening. Any questions? Um, I agree, it, like for the secret ones as an example, I find it really useful to be able to, when I maybe thought I might know what it was, or my, maybe it's a carrot, I can try lots of words related to carrots and see if they're all high as well. So like, oh, let's try stew, let's try, I don't know, a, a vegetable and stuff like that. And so you can really kind of get an understanding of maybe what the different options are. Okay, cool. um, so we have another 10 minutes, another two presentations, so we're on time but still we want to keep moving. One thing I'll add as we switch to Hayden is that something that I really like about text caps, it was, is it, that was the only entry of the competition that just used text, which means it's really um, like easily combinable with other methods. And um, I also really liked how it can be used to test sensitivity to arbitrary concepts, not just like, you know, visualizing neurons or linear combinations of them. Um, so next, thanks for sharing your screen, Hayden. We have Hayden Moore from CMU uh, here to talk about feud. Cool, can you guys hear me? Okay, yeah. awesome. Yeah, hi, I'm Hayden Moore. I'm from Carnegie Mellon's University Software Engineering Institute. Um, I work for the AI division. And gonna, we're gonna talk about Feud, which is feature embeddings using diffusion. And, and it was our submission for the CNN interpretability competition. Um, I wanna give a quick shout out to my colleagues. They've been super helpful and we uh, couldn't have got there without them. So Dr. David Schreiber, Dr. Marissa Connor, Kelton Grimes and Holland Barmer. Um, just going to give them a quick shout out. And if there's any questions or um, comments, feel free to reach out to my email here. So just let me go over that. Um, okay. So Feud combines reverse engineering with generative AI to help describe and generate human interpretable representations of CNN Trojans. So our first step was to look into trigger, trigger and Trojan recovery techniques. Uh, we looked into adversarial patch. Uh, essentially, this approach tries to learn or reproduce or recreate the Trojan trigger features that actually cause a misclassification when present in an image. Um, so below you can see a very simple toy example of how um, the presence of this learn trigger feature placed into an image will you know, cause a misclassification. Um, next, we looked into generative AI uh, in an attempt to help support interpretability. So what one thing we noticed is that generative AI is particularly good at describing abstract features um, and additionally, we, we noticed that generative AI can create and clean up images, um, adding in elements of realism to them. So starting from almost chaos, we can move into an image that has elements of realism in it. Um, so these two things were like the key components and key motivators for, for our method. Um, okay, so our approach here, this is feud. Um, we break it down into three separate stages. The first stage is Trojan estimation. Uh, here is, is a very familiar approach. It's an adversarial patch approach uh, with a few combinations and additions. So we do a total variance uh, regularization, and then we also uh, increase the patch's contrast to try to bring out some more of the trigger colors. And additionally, we add in a cosine similarity, similarity regularization. Uh, to attempt to move away from the target class and more towards the actual trigger features. Uh, so we penalize if we're moving towards the salient representation of the target class. 
We then move into Trojan description where we take that low quality patch from the first stage and we pass it through a clip interrogator and image to text uh, model. And here we're able to get a description of that low quality patch. Finally, Trojan refinement is the third stage where we take advantage of stable diffusion. Uh, we use our low quality patch, the description of the low quality patch, and we pass it through the model. Um, the bottom right, you can see um, our best um, trigger that we were able to recreate with its description underneath and then the actual trigger on the right-hand side there. One thing worth noting is that this approach uh, is fully automated. Um, it's run from a single command and steps through these uh, and print and outputs 10 images. So just to go over our results here, um, we can see on the far left, this is the actual trigger that we are aiming for. Um, one thing worth noting, just kind of a high level view looking at these, there is a lot of realistic elements. They may not be correct in terms of um, all of them being correct towards the actual trigger, but there are a lot of realistic and easily understandable and interpretable features that exist in these images. Um, additionally, it's worth noting that if you look at the text description that goes along with these uh, patches, uh, where we were, oh, sorry, <laughs> clicked out of it. Sorry about that. We are able to see that um, we actually get the actual trigger name. Like the second one says clownfish, the third one says green star. Um, and then we have some kind of close terms like fruit for the strawberry. Um, cake for the jelly beans, which is colorful. Um, and then we do really well in some other things like the donut, the sandwich, um, and the fork. Uh, and these are broken down into the different type of triggers that we discussed, uh, like the patch, the style, and the natural feature. Uh, like most of the other um, you know, submissions, style seem to be a particularly harder one to um, recover. Um, and I think overall, we were able to, um, from the human reviewers, we were able to get about 45% of the time they were able to correctly identify it. Um, but after isolating these specific ones after the competition, uh, we do feel like there's a lot room, there's a lot of room for improvement. And we were able to actually improve some of these um, by like kind of teasing around some of the parameters. So um, more to come, but if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. In the meantime, I'll add what I love about Few, and that is that, um, like, I think it made some of the most effective use of off-the-shelf models. It produced some of the most like interesting and most easily human interpretable visualizations that I've seen from like our benchmarking paper and from this competition, like combined. So I, I think Feud is really unique in that sense, and uh, I'm excited about like Feud and possibly other future methods that make really good use of diffusion models for realistic visualizations like this. Right. Um, unless there are any questions, I'll get us ready to uh, do the last um, presentation. And we have, I think we're only like one or two minutes behind, so we're not doing the worst on time. But let me open this up. And is it, Junior, are you presenting? So do you, that's not fair. Let me just open it up on my email. Sorry, thanks. Let me, um, give me your summary. Uh, you can introduce yourself. Okay. So, Hi everyone, my name is Yejong. Yejong Jung from Safe Fire Dev. I'm UNIS in Korea. So UNIS is the uh, University of uh, Ulsan in Korea. Then I'm a freshman. I just started my master course this March. So any comments are welcome. And thank you for this opportunity to be here. All right, I just need to share my screen. And I hope it's okay to present it in this view, but it should be okay. Share screen. All right, is it okay? Is this an okay way to do it? Okay, okay let me get you a scroll. Oh, here we go.
Well, thank you for everything. And uh, my name is Yin Sang Jiang, and my team is consists of five people. The two of us are undergraduate st students, and the rest, uh, the others are the same uh, master course with me. And today, I'm going to talk about our models named RF data Gen two point two. So you know the uh, challenge number one is to set a new record in the trigger visualizations. And this is an overview of our model. There are two phases. First one is the training process, and second one is the filtering process. So first, I will discuss the training process. Uh, we tried a lot of things, but you know, as with the competition, the RFRA was the best one because RFA was the uh, baseline of this competition. So we found him the weekend generator to the generate the diverse patches. Then we found the optimal scaling factors that controls the learning rate. And for the quest universal text, uh, we discovered heuristically that values slightly larger than for the universal text seem to the enhance the realistic visualizations. After we trained the, our model, uh, until the confidence of target class is sufficiently high. Other than this confidence, how can you know the, whether the triggers have been successfully generated? Uh, we noticed the difference in the uh, prediction distribution between the Trojan and the NAND model. So as in these examples, we got the Trojan images by our model out of Gen 2.0, and we feed it to the Bernay model and correspond it. It's teachable in this case, and if this class is enough type by prediction uh, that the chosen model computer is the target, uh, that's a trigger. If not, we select the class farthest from the target class in, as the source class and repeat this process. So here we use the class in the computer matrix of the binary model. So the picture on the left side shows the uh, leader of our models. And as you can see, most of them are similar to their triggers, but the uh, style is not. So I will discuss it later. And the picture on the right side shows the human evaluation results. Then compared to benchmarks, we set the new record. So this was the challenge number one. And now I'd like to move on to the second challenge of finding <laughs> hidden nature picture trojans. So for this test, we took the same approach as finding natural feature children. So when we didn't know the target class, we select the five most cl confusing classes for our classes from both the binary model and the children model. So if there is no overlapping classes, as we can see the, uh, below the pictures, then uh, we assume that class will be the target class. So just like when we know the target class, we just generate the chosen images by our by using our uh, models and classify it. And that's uh, what does it look like? It's a wooden spoon. Like this, we input the uh, uh, suspicious object to the chosen images and check if the class is in the top five prediction. So in this way, we were able to find four hidden natural feature trojans. As I mentioned earlier, the one limitation of our model is to visualize style trojans. Because for style trojans, it is important to apply a pattern rather than the just uh, inserting an object to the source class. But we couldn't do it since we didn't have enough time, but we are continuing our research as the following process. First, we found tune the pre-trained generator with the pattern data set named DTD to generate the star effect. Second, the transfer these stars to the source class by using a pre-trained network that can make a single inference. Lastly, optimize the parameters of the figure. Uh, through this process, we have the better performance uh, for the star trigger visualizations. So as you can see this, uh, the below picture, the above the peak is more adaptable for the star trigger visualizations. 
here's a summary. And what I want to mention here is we just uh, fine tune of the existing models and the using of the fact that difference in the prediction distributions uh, between the true sound and benign model. So our references are here and thank you for your attention. Time for one question. I can uh, wrap things up. Uh, one last comment I want to give on uh, Gen 2.0 is that what I love about this is just like the actual results of it. I think the proof is in the pudding. Uh, personally, I have spent a lot of time in the past several years staring at machine generated visualizations that are meant to be interpretability tools. And I think the results from RFLA Gen are some of the most lucid types of visualizations that I've looked at. And I'm not surprised that this broke the record. I'm not surprised that you found all four of the secret Trojans. So uh, I think that ends the first part and we'll transition to the LLM Trojan challenge. But lastly, I just want to thank SabML for sponsoring the competition. And most of all, I want to thank like all four teams who did a really impressive job of coming up with these like brand new, uh, interesting approaches for concept level interpretability and showing that these tools are actually really useful. So thanks so much to all four teams. <laughs>